from Community Public Radio, this is the CPR News. From New York, I'm Don DeBar. Today we go to Moscow to speak with geopolitical analyst Mark Sloboda about what's going on in Ukraine. Okay, Mark, welcome back. Um, You know, we're being treated to one portrayal of events in and around Ukraine, Russia, Europe, and uh, it varies an awful lot with what I see in media from around the world. I'm wondering what the whole situation looks like from your vantage point in Moscow. If you've been paying at all attention to social media in the last week or the mainstream media uh, in the United States or or Europe, uh, you are well aware that uh, Ukraine is, uh, you know, the Kiev regime in Ukraine is winning this conflict hands down and that Russian forces are in retreat and that uh, it is expected that uh, Azov battalion in the right sector will uh, storm uh, uh, Moscow on uh, Thursday, and they'll probably be in the Vladivostok by Friday. Um, so, so it is quite obvious that uh, Zelensky is with, you know, backed up by the power of, of, of the U.S. Uh, corporate controlled mainstream media completely in bed with their own government, that uh, he's winning the information war. He's, he's winning, winning the meme war hands down. Um, And a big, of course, element of this is not only to galvanize around the world, but to put pressure on uh, Western governments uh, to militarily intervene uh, in the conflict, which of course would mean uh, open war between two nuclear armed uh, great one great, one superpower, uh, NATO and uh, Russia. Um, Another big uh, goal of this information war is to try to demoralize uh, the Russian public at home, to convince them that they're losing, that all of their boys are coming home in body bags, uh, that their economy is about to collapse, um, and, and so on, uh, and, and, and of course, to to demonize the leader and the government and and everything like this. Um, of course, this winning of the information war of the of the meme war does not has very little, if any, relation uh, to the war of steel and blood on the ground in Ukraine. Um, And it is certainly true from what I can tell and from what some of the U.S.'s own uh, best serious Russia-focused military experts uh, are saying um, is, is, is that while the Russian military made some mistakes early on, uh, that they have adjusted. You should not be paying attention to the pundits, uh, you know, on social media um, without any serious credentials, you uh, can ignore what the Washington Post, what the New York Times uh, is saying, uh, columnists like Ann Applebaum or uh, former U.S. Ambassador <laughs> Michael McFaul, uh, who you want to pay attention to uh, in English is um, serious military analysts. Um, and I'll I'll give you a couple of names. Uh, Michael Kaufman. Michael Kaufman is the head of uh, Russian military analysis at the Center for Naval Analysis, and he's also a senior fellow uh, in the same at the Center for New American Security. Um, he is a a serious person to follow. Um, he uh, he's on. T- Twitter. Um, he has uh, been quoted uh, uh, in in piecemeal around uh, a, a few Western mainstream media articles, but you know, always kind of left out of the, the narrative headline and the context. Uh, he's also written a few articles and done some podcasts at War on the Rocks, uh, an online uh, you know military um, outlet 
uh, military focused outlet, uh, military foreign policy focused outlet that I think you should follow. You know, you don't <laughs> necessarily believe everything that's written there, but uh, that's certainly where he's located. Um, and I, I should say that Michael Kaufman himself uh, is originally from Ukraine. Uh, he's he's from Kiev um, and, uh, you know, he's been around and he is by no means a supporter of of the Russian military intervention in Ukraine. Uh, but he is also a serious military analyst and his discussions, uh, his writings, his uh, podcasts that he's doing for War on the Rocks are largely devoid of any political rhetoric or anything like that, which is extremely refreshing in this uh, toxic yeah. uh, media and social media climate. Another one to follow, particularly for uh, uh, OSINT, open source intelligence, is uh, Rob Lee, um, who is um, – he uh, was a PhD student until recently at King's uh, War College. Um, he's a former Marine. Um, and um, he is now uh, a fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, and he's really good to follow for open source intelligence, although with with both of these, they generally – they avoid focusing on um, Ukrainian military uh, OSINT uh, or Ukrainian forces uh, because, you know, they're – Supporting, you know, their government is supporting Ukraine. So, you know, uh, keep that in mind. Uh, but they're generally good and serious to people to follow. And why I think particularly they're good and serious people to follow is that um, they uh, a uh, about what, eight months ago when when Russia had a military buildup in April of last year and uh, the whole headlines were full of Russian intervention, Russian invasion at the time, uh, they correctly identified as as I did at the time, that that was for deterrent purposes to prevent uh, Kiev uh, from launching a a, a uh, military campaign. They had a build up uh, to take back uh, the Donbass by military force. Uh, but in November, uh, at the most recent military build up, they started to see, as I did, that this build up was uh, qualitatively and, and quantitatively quite different um, and was less about deterrent purposes than it was about building the option for a military interruption uh, intervention and having it in place in case diplomacy failed and they're also quite good on actually identifying what russia's political motivations are uh, for the intervention so i strongly suggest you watch them and what they have been saying is one is that uh, Russia made some early mistakes. Uh, they tried a, 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 some maneuvers around Kiev in the first uh, you know, one to three days of the military campaign that were intended as a decapitation strike that were risky and just didn't work out. I would even go far to say is that they were harebrained. But that was obviously kind of like <laughs> a, a opening gambit. And if that didn't work, they clearly had, you know, the, the military forces assembled for a, a, a longer confrontation, which is what is happening now. Um, and they also clearly identify that uh, the Russian military has gone, you know, almost ridiculously out of its way to avoid, to minimize as much as possible civilian casualties not only civilian casualties, but casualties among the Ukrainian military, right. because they still hope to to win back the hearts and minds of, of at least the majority of Ukrainians, maybe not Western Ukraine, uh, but also to encourage as many of Ukrainian regular military, you know, uh, it is a conscript army to surrender uh, because, uh, one, they actually to care far more about the lives of the majority of Ukrainians than the people in Washington do, who are, are willing to put weapons in anyone's hands to throw at and bleed Russia, uh, you know, till the very end. Uh, you know, the, the U.S. will gladly fight Russia to the last Ukrainian conscript that they can throw. Uh, you know, but also, of course, for their, their political goals, which are putting a, uh, a political uh, regime in place uh, in Kiev uh, to replace the uh, you know the U.S. backed Maidan Putsch that seized power in 2014 to regime change the regime change, and they they simply can't accomplish that even with a transitional government dominated by the Eastern Ukrainian political forces that have been brutally repressed for the last eight years. They can't do that if there's so many uh, you know dead 
Ukrainians, right? Because every Ukrainian that dies, whether civilian or military, is a Ukrainian family that whatever they might have thought beforehand uh, now now hates Russia almost uh, securely. So, it, you know, of course, right. it's a very difficult operation. But they go to say that it has gone so far as to inhibit Russia's military success. And, and right. you know, they've predicted also accurately that Russia would have to, you know, take all that they you could describe it as Russia's fighting with one hand tied behind the back and one uh, hand wearing a kid glove. Uh, This is not a U.S. style shock and awe military campaign such as you saw in the U.S. invasion, uh, bombing and invasion and occupation of Iraq uh, in 2003. It's kind of the exact opposite. Of that. Yeah, even as a matter of, of fact, articles. even even as a matter of fact, the kind of campaign that Kiev has been conducting against the eastern hmm. part of the country because Agreed. they've been bombing That's the hell out point. of it. That's a good point. That they've been bombing residential buildings and um, you know everyone because they view everyone in East Ukraine as terrorists. That's that's how legally they, identify, they were designated that legally. Or pro-Russian separatists. Right. Um, and all, all you have to do is, is pull up the UN, the OSCE reports and the UN reports on the subject to see that the vast majority of civilian casualties uh, for the last few years and before um, were, uh, you know, were from uh, uh, Kiev regime shells falling uh, on the, the Donbass. Like 80 percent. Yeah, uh, that's 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 pretty indisputable. Um, so. Um, you know, Russia, the Russian military is designed to fight in combined arms maneuver in Europe on the, you know, the, the plains of, of, of uh, Central and Eastern Europe against NATO. And here they're trying to do something. They are, the Russian military is extremely artillery and tank heavy, particularly the artillery, right? They, it has long been uh, Soviet and Russian military doctrine. They have the best artillery in the world. And um, they're not using it. They're barely using it at all. If the Russian military was targeting civilians, right, and and using their artillery the way the Russian military is designed to fight, they would be leveling entire cities in right. days, right. and you would have thousands, perhaps tens of thousands of deaths a day. Right. Right. Yep. Um, they uh, are almost not using their air power. Right. Very limited use of air power because of the indiscriminate nature of shock and awe style air power. Um, and there are not just Kaufman and, and Rob Lee are saying this, you know, that I suggested before, but actually there's articles all over. National Interest just ran an article speculating about why Russia is not using uh, their air power to to, you know, anywhere near the, uh, the the power that they have assembled or the extent that they could. Um, uh, the same thing, electronics warfare. Russia could shut down these cities, right? There would be no internet. There would be no Twitter pictures getting out. It wouldn't, right. uh, you know, yeah, they could shut down power. That is not being used as well so as not to, uh, you know, inconvenience the civilian population and to increase the chance that their message gets out to the Ukrainian people, that they're not here to to fight them. They don't view them as the enemy. They're here to get rid of the regime backed by the U.S. that seized power, you know, it, from their perspective, violently and unconstitutionally in 2014 and to denazify the country. <laughs> because uh, right. when I don't care if you're 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 uh, you know the the president of the Putsch regime, I don't care that his daddy was Jewish. Uh, that is not an excuse, a defense, a justification for the right. undeniable fact that the regime in Kiev has state armed and state funded neo-Nazi death squads. Right. Azov, the right sector, C14, right. integrated throughout their military, their police their security forces, their mainstream political parties that they have sent to kill their own people in East Ukraine for eight years. You don't get to say that, right? You don't get to say that he's a liberal Democrat or, you know, you know, no, no, I'm sorry. If if you're doing that, if you're the president of a uh, uh, regime that has declared that World War II era Holocaust perpetrating Nazi collaborators from West Ukraine are the heroes and founding fathers of your country. Right. You don't you don't get to claim that 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 there's no Nazis in geo in Ukraine because you're because the president's daddy was Jewish. You know, because right? the Azov, the Azov yeah. uh, brigade, for example, one of those groups you just described. 
last Friday I posted a photograph of them taken by them in front of some of their insignia, and that photograph got me suspended from Facebook okay. for violating community standards, and the reason Revealing. was the sim- their symbology is Nazi symbology. The um, NPR just did a piece uh, uh, with the mayor of a uh, Ukrainian uh, town that is in the conflict area, uh, Konotop, uh, it, la- in the last few days. Um, and this guy, I mean, there have been articles written in the Jer- Jerusalem Post about how shocked they, the people, uh, the Jews of this town were that a neo-Nazi has become mayor of, of their town. They, they, when they did this interview with him, they, he had prominently displayed right behind him in a framed portrait, Stefan Pandera. Stefan Pandera I saw that, yeah. is, was the – the um, the principal, the, the largest, uh, most important leader of the organization of Ukrainian nationalists and the Ukrainian insurgent army, that were the Nazi collaborators that armed, that allied, uh, you know, with Hitler when he invaded. They welcomed him with open arms in West Ukraine and and participated in the Holocaust so eagerly and vigorously, um, you know, against Jews, also against massacres, large massacres against Poles, that even the uh, the, the SS were taken aback. And they're like, well, dudes, chill. I mean, yeah. that's that's just that's you don't need to be quite that excessive. And, yeah. um, you know, he had a picture of him. They, the NPR tried to blur it out a bit behind him to make it indistinct. Yeah, but he obviously that. positioned it right there. He's not afraid of it. He's not ashamed of it. Right. This was put directly behind him to indicate, you know, his ideological loyalty. Yeah. And if you if you watch the pictures coming, I, you know, I've seen multiple pictures, you know, come out uh, from the British press, from the American press. It seems that they're almost unable to do a photo op without <laughs> accidentally, I would hope getting a, uh, you know, a, one of these far right, you know, either battalion members or their, their followers that have infiltrated the military right. and are wearing Azov patches, yeah. uh, the red and black right sector patches, the black sun, the neo-Nazi symbol, right? Yeah. Uh, there was a big deal. Uh, it was promoted around the world. It was uh, in media around the world, the story of a uh, grandmother uh, uh, who was training in the Ukrainian in self-defense forces, right? Uh, what they didn't tell you is that she is a West Ukrainian ultra-nationalist herself who has political beliefs that would be considered particularly abhorrent uh, in the West, yeah. but that she was being trained by the neo-Nazi death squad a- Azov, right? That's who was actually doing the training. Wow. And I mean, it's all actually, when you zoom in on the pictures, it's quite evident because of the patches, you know, yeah, right. the, the guy is wearing top of his camouflage right there. Um, you know, and, and this isn't a, f- a, a, a few far right forces, right? A, a scattered, you know, in some battalion. This is integrated all through the political system. Um, the number two on Poroshenko's European Solidarity Party is the neo Nazi. Andrei Perubi, who founded the Social Nationalist Party in Ukraine, the man is is straight up. Uh, he's actually old school Banderite fascist. He's, right. You can't even call him a, the founder of the right sector. Uh, Dmitry Yarosh uh, um, was appointed the advisor to the head of Ukraine's military in November under a Jewish president. Right. Wow. I, I, my daddy was Jewish president because he's not actually a practicing Jewish. Right? Right, right. He himself personally in December pinned a hero of Ukraine medal on a right sector neo-Nazi fighter um, for kill for killing other Ukrainians in right. East Ukraine. Right. I, yep. His own oligarch patron. Right. Uh, Zelensky has a patron whose uh, television show that launched his campaign where he played some guy who, who accident a, a comedian uh, who, uh, you know, played the role of some guy who accidentally became the president of Ukraine. Right. And then, whoa, Zelensky accidentally became there. It's like a virtual yep. candidate here, yep. you know, manufactured. Kolomoisky, Igor Kolomoisky, uh, a, one of the big Ukrainian oligarchs, also supported the Maidan from the beginning. Also Jewish, by the yeah. way, uh, yeah. in, in Israeli in dual citizenship in Israel, right. uh, something that's actually illegal now under Ukrainian law. But, right. you know, <laughs> the oligarch, you know, it's different for them. Yeah. Um, and um, he, according to the Ukrainian press, was 
one of the probably the most principal funder of these far right battalions in Ukraine from the very beginning. <laughs> but how can that be? He's Jewish. Right? And this isn't to say that, you know, know. these know. this is not an anti Semitic screed. This is not Jewish. These particular people are supporting, you know, uh, neo Nazis in Ukraine. All right? right. I mean, and you 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 don't get to, to claim that that's not real or not important I, or justify it away by the fact that he's Jewish. That it is actually anti Semitic. Yeah, it is. I'm concerned, right? It's assuming characters. Um, this is the same thing when Obama, yeah. America's first black president, registered trademark. Um, handed Africa over to the Pentagon with AFRICOM. I mean, he c comes into office, n mem number of African nations that are allied with uh, U.S. AFRICOM, zero. He kills Gaddafi. He, he helps uh, Sarkozy drive uh, Bagbo from power. They put some kind of move on, on South Africa. I don't know what happened with uh, what's-his-face there, but... Um, all of a sudden, within like a year and a half of their blowing up Libya, you have 35 African nations that are members of AFRICOM. In other words, Obama, America's first black president, hands Africa to the Pentagon. But he couldn't do that because he's black. That's a ridiculous statement, you know, position to take. Yeah, it's it's an Orwellian. It's a ridiculous argument. Yeah. It has no validity whatsoever. It's used repeatedly. Another big one is that, oh, you know, the far right political parties, you know, in Ukraine only get a few percent. How can they be? Able to, because the right since 2014 has become fully integrated through the mainstream Ukrainian right. political parties. All their leaders have left them and they're like Andrei Perubi and they've been they're number two in, in, on, on Ukraine's, uh, you know, the Poroshenko's own European Solidarity Party. I mean, they've they they've left those behind as a as a vehicle uh, and, and integrated further, you know, throughout the political parties and the power institutions of Ukraine. And the fact is, you know, right now, their violence and hatred is directed primarily at um, uh, uh, ethnic Russians, uh, right. Slovak East Ukrainians and leftists. Right. And as long as that is, they are a useful tool. Right. Uh, of, of course, they realize they I mean, they've talked openly about it on videos. You can see it. They realize that they are uh, they are considered a useful tool and they're willing to play that role because they know it's giving them more control and political power, yeah. not just in Ukraine. So they're kosher right now, right? That's, that's a horrible right. thing to say. No, to but it's that, true. That, that's, you know, that's, particular that's, expression. It's true, yeah. right? Um, and they, they, you know, they, I, you know, I've seen pictures of right sector battalions now being sent off with advanced British and American anti-tank and uh, anti-aircraft uh, handheld weapons and laws, man pads, right? They're, they're proudly displaying themselves armed with them. I mean, this is the U.S. and British governments and governments across Europe literally arming neo-Nazi death squads in Ukraine now with advanced weapons. Azov, Why? The Azov was posing with Israeli it, weapons, too. Yeah. Israel. And why? Because they're useful geopolitical tools. It is no right. different than the U.S. and the U.K. Uh, you know, arming, salaring, and 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 uh, um, supporting, uh, head chopping, uh, suicide bombing jihadists in in uh, in Syria, uh, uh, Islamists allied with Al Qaeda in Libya, uh, the jihadists in Afghanistan in the right. 80s, yep. the uh, right wing death squads that the U.S. trains up in South and Central America right. to right. you know to to wipe out leftists down the, trade unionists and everyone <clears throat> down there. This is the exact same phenomenon, and there's a history for it because the CIA f was trying to start in the early days of the Cold War, right after World War II, in insurrection among many of these same people's right. grandfathers, That's right. the Nazi collaborators in West Ukraine, uh, right after World War II. They were trying to start up a insurrection there. Um, and a lot of them left in this diaspora. Uh, they fled and they came to the United States and Canada. And it's why you can find monuments all over the northern U.S. and Canada, uh, wherever there is this particular type of Ukrainian. It's not to say that all, all Ukrainians. Uh, you, uh, they're still a minority in the country. They 
they just wield incredible political and social power right now because of what happened in 2014 with the overthrow of the government. Um, monuments to, to, to these neo-Nazis all over uh, the U.S. and Canada. And the U, U, the Canada's own, uh, she was previously the foreign minister, she has another position in the government, Christia Freeland, was a West U Ukrainian uh, newspaper propagandist uh, for uh, uh, you know, among these uh, West Ukrainian Bandarai fascists for the Nazi. I mean, she deliberately worked at propaganda. He, I'm sorry, did. And she has never apologized. She tried to deny it for the longest time, and she re refuses to apologize for it. And she was just pictured at a pro-Ukrainian rally um, where she is handed and is holding up a banner of the red and black right sector, right? Also, previously <laughs> Obviously, the flag of the Nazi collaborating organization of Ukrainian nationalists. And then she goes on the air to recall that the, uh, you know, the truckers movement uh, in Canada, I don't agree with their anti-vaxxer nonsense myself, but th she then calls them Nazis, right? <laughs> <laughs> She's literally holding up a, a, a uh, you know, Nazi collaborating fascist right. uh, banner yep. uh, in support of, of all of this in Ukraine. And um, so the Russian uh, military has two different rules of engagement in Ukraine when when facing combatants. Uh, if it's regular Ukrainian military, they are encouraged as much as possible to lay down their arms, to surrender, uh, to, uh, you know, after signing a piece of paper that they, they will no longer protect paid in the conflict, uh, send back to their families. There's a very different rule of engagement for these battalion members and, and you know, for those who are clearly identified as such, uh, you know, among other uh, forces in Ukraine. And uh, <laughs> they are, you know, that's part of the denazification program. They will be treated, you know, not with kid gloves, shall we say. Uh, they, they will be uh, dealt with harshly um, as, and Russia considers them not lawful combatants and the you know the uh you know uh, rules of war allow for very very different treatment these are terrorists uh, if, such if anyone is yeah. right if anyone's yeah, a terrorist in the world nazis with guns are terrorists and on the ground right now uh you know one example of this going on is in the southeast russia has basically at this point liberated all of the southeast coast of the country uh from the donbass to the Dnieper river and there's one holdout along the uh, city of Mariupol, which had originally gone for the Russian Spring and then was conquered by Azov. Uh, and uh, they've been headquartered there to keep control. There's a large population mm. of um, Ukrainian Greeks there that have been screaming in Greece about you know, how they are treated by these neo-Nazis that are trying to kill them there that have been there for eight, 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 almost eight years now. Um, and this city is under siege and uh, they are preventing humanitarian corridors. Uh, I've heard it from multiple places. I just heard it from a neighbor of mine, uh, so a, a woman I go out, uh, we occasionally walk our dog with in Mariupol and they lost contact with them on March 2nd. But Azov has set up snipers on the residential buildings, the factories, the stores, and so on. Not specifically, you know, at the moment to to target, you know, uh, Russian uh, DNR forces coming into the city, but to target people who try to flee to use the humanitarian corridors right. that've been set up. Right. Sometimes they've been physically preventing them from using the corridors, and sometimes they've actually been shooting them. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's what's going on because they hate the people of Mariupol and the people of Mariupol hate them and all the the uh, Western, you know, uh, prop Kiev regime propaganda, the, the contrary, uh, cannot change that. By the way, you're in Moscow. Are you suffering any from the uh, heavy sanctions that we're throwing at you? They're going to be heavy. We've seen some inflation, uh, you know, particularly on imported items that that's going to be unquestioned. Yeah, well. um, I know Russian companies are already having to change their ingredients. They're scrambling to use Chinese sources who are very eager to fill that role, by the way. And capable. Um, yep, that's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> all right, right we got to run. We'll, we'll catch up with you next week. All right. Cheers. And that's all the news we have for you right now. For Community Public Radio, I'm Don DeBar in New York. Thanks for listening.